Hello, everybody. Welcome back to my project of reading the entire Advanced Dungeons and Dragons Dungeon Master's Guide all the way through. Uh, we're going to go for an um, hour, maybe two hours today. See how far we get. On our last video, we got all the way through the end of Thieves and Assassins setting traps. So we're going to pick up right from there. Before we start, though, remember to be subscribed to the channel, and uh, you can hit that bell icon as well if you want to get uh, notified when new videos like this one drop. Oh, you can also check out the Questing Beast newsletter. I just put out a second newsletter, uh, issue number two, and that is packed with tons of new videos and articles from around the uh, hobby gaming world that I found to be interesting. So that's right down there in the description if you want to check that out. You can subscribe to that to get that sent right to your email if you like. All right, I got my Guinness. Everything's good to go. Let's take off. So our next section is assassination experience points. An assassin receives 100 XP per level of the character assassinated minus or plus 50 XP for every level the assassin is greater or lesser than his or her victim. This is modified by multipliers for the degree of difficulty of the mission. Simple, X and a half. Difficult, X times one. Or extraordinary, X uh, times one and a half. The explanations for difficulty given under spying should be used as guidelines here. The experience given above is added to the regular experience earned for killing the victim, um, as if he or she were a monster. Experience is also given for the fee the assassin is paid. So it's a little uh, strange that it's talking about how much XP you get for killing monsters, but it doesn't tell you how much that actually is. That's another rule somewhere else in the book. So, I mean, this book has a lot of organization problems where things will be mentioned before they are explained. So there's a lot of order problems there, I think. Although maybe it's in the player's handbook. I don't know. Therefore, if an 8th level assassin snuck up on and surprised a 10th level magic user in the dungeon and successfully assassinated him, the assassin would receive 1000 XP plus another 100 XP since the magic user was two levels higher than he. However, since it was a simple mission, the total uh, 1100 XP would be multiplied by one half giving 550 points. This is added to the 2,400 XP normally received for killing this magic user, making a final total of 2,950 XP earned, exclusive of fees. I wonder if anyone actually used those rules. I'm sure someone did. That seems uh, way too fiddly for me. Anytime you have to pull out a calculator to figure out stuff in D&D, it's too much for me. Assassins use of poison. Assassins use poison just as any other character does, according to the dictates of the DM. That is, they use the normal tables for poison types. Um, when, a, when an assassin reaches ninth level, assassin, he or she may opt to make a study of poisons. This decision should come from the player uh, in the case of a player character, i.e. do not suggest it or even intimate that such a study can be undertaken. Seems a little underhanded to me. Uh, the study will require many weeks and cost from 2,000 to 8,000 gold pieces per week. The assassin must find a mentor. An assassin who has already made such a study and actually has put the techniques into practice. In most cases, this will be a non-player character, assassin of 12th or higher level, who will charge the, uh, the variable amount. The cost reflects both time and the poisons used in the training. If a player character is involved, he or she must actually have a wide variety of animal, vegetable, and mineral poisons on hand for the training, where he or she can also set the fee as he or she sees fit. So I like the idea that you actually have to go out and find a mentor in order to get training in poisons. It's not just something that unlocks. You have to engage with the setting. That's neat. Um, the idea that there's no way that... Uh, they're going to know that they can study poisons unless they think about it and specifically ask for it. I'm not crazy about that. Um, it's uh, it makes I don't I don't know what's the best way to put this. 
it is, yeah, it just seems underhanded, I guess. Like the DM and the player aren't just both people having a good time. I don't know. At least when I play these types of games, um, I'm very open to my players about what their options are and things that they can do. Um, it is not the place of this work to actually serve as a manual for poisons and poisoning. Oh, that's too bad. Not only is such a subject distasteful, <laughs> but it would not properly mesh with the standard poison system used herein. Therefore, the assassin must spend five to eight weeks to learn each of the following poison skills. Um, first one, proper use of all poisons effective in the bloodstream only. Proper use of poisons effective through ingestion only. Proper use of contact poisons and poisons effective when in the bloodstream or ingested. And finally, the manufacturer of poisons and their antidotes. Thus, after 20 to 32 weeks of study, the assassin will have complete knowledge of 90% of all poisons known. He or she can then use poisons at full normal effect and have the following options as well. Choose to assassinate by an instantaneous poison. Elect to use a slow acting poison, which will not begin to affect the victim for one to four hours after ingestion. Or elect to use a poison which gradually builds up after repeated doses and kills one to 10 days after the final dose. So this is another indication that you're probably supposed to have multiple characters going at once in a campaign game, because this can take up to 32 weeks of study. I suppose that you could say that you're studying in your downtime between adventures, but also you could just say that your assassin is just off studying and then you just keep track of the time while you're running uh, adventures with a different character and then eventually you go back to your assassin. The assassin must compound the poison, of course. The DM will have to adjudicate this manufacturer as he or she deems best. To simulate such manufacture, it is suggested that a week of time and a relatively small outlay, 200 to 1,200 gold pieces for materials, bribes, etc., suffice for any poison. Instantaneous and very slow, undetectable poisons should be more time-consuming and costly, but not greatly so. This does not guarantee the assassin's success, naturally for he or she must still manage the poisoning and the escape. However, it will give a far better chance and also provide leverage with regard to a slow poison by knowing the antidote. Note that the assassin can stop his or her study at any point, knowing only the knowledge gained in the completed course of study. Also, during any course of study, the assassin may not engage in any other activity, or he or she must begin studying again from the beginning of the course. This means that during the Five to eight game weeks, the assassin the assassin character will be out of play. So there you go. You can't even go back and forth on adventures with them. One type of poison which assassins can learn to, to compound is blade venom. Blade venom, always an insinuative poison, see poison types, evaporates quickly. For the first day after its application, it does full damage. The second day half, and by the third day none. It is likewise removed by use. On the first hit, it will do full damage. On the second hit, half damage. And by the third, it will be gone. Partially evaporated or used death poisons allow the victim a plus four on his or her saving throw. Poison types. The poison of monsters, regardless of its pluses or minuses to the victim's saving throw, is an all or nothing affair. That is, either they do no damage or they kill the victim within a minute or so. Poison potions generally do the same, although you may optionally elect to have any given one be slow acting, so that the victim will notice nothing for one to ten hours after quaffing it. Monster poisons are uh, all effective by either ingestion or insinuation into the body and bloodstream of the victim. Poison potions must be ingested. If you allow poison use by characters in your campaign, users can purchase ingestive or insinuative uh, poisons only having to obtain dual-use poisons from monsters. Purchase poisons are classified and priced as follows. We have a uh, little table here where costs go from five gold pieces to a thousand, um, generally going becoming more expensive as they are more deadly. The more uh, deadly ones can do uh, instant death. Moving on to our next page. We have a great little piece of artwork here. Some little, uh, looks like kobolds, little dog creatures fighting a dragon. Assassins use all forms of poison. 
other than those listed above, at an efficiency which gives the victim plus one on the saving throw. All other character types use them at an efficiency level, which allows the victim plus two on saves, in all cases. Assassins who have studied poisoning have no penalty. See Assassin's Use of Poisons. Our next section is the monster as a player character. On occasion, one player or another will evidence a strong desire to operate as a monster. Conceive, conceiving a playable character as a strong demon, a devil, a dragon, or one of the most powerful sorts of undead creatures. This is done principally because the player sees the desired monster character as superior to his or her peers and likely to provide a dominant role for him or her in the campaign. A moment of reflection will bring them to the un unalterable conclusion that the game is heavily weighted towards mankind. Advanced D&D is unquestionably humanocentric with demi-humans, semi-humans, and humanoids in various orbits around the sun of humanity. Men are the worst monsters, particularly high-level characters such as clerics, fighters, and magic users, whether singly, in small groups, or in large companies. The ultra-powerful beings of other planes are more fearsome. The three Ds of demigods, demons, and devils are enough to strike fear into most characters, let alone when the very gods themselves are brought into consideration. Yet there is a point where the well-equipped, high-level party of adventurers can challenge a demon prince, an archdevil, a demigod. While there might, be, there might well be some near or part humans within the group so doing, it is certain that the leaders will be human. I don't know why that is. That's not totally clear. In cooperation, men bring ruin upon monsterdom, for they have no upper limits as to level or acquired power from spells or items. I suppose that kind of answers that. The game features humankind for a reason. It is the most logical basis in an illogical game. From a design aspect, it provides the sound groundwork. From a standpoint of creating the campaign milieu, it provides the most uh, readily usable assumptions. From a participation approach, it is the only method uh, for all players are, after all is said and done, human, and it allows them the role with which most are most desirous and capable of identifying with. From all views, then, it is enough fantasy to assume a swords and sorcery cosmos, with impossible professions and make-believe magic. To adventure amongst the weird is fantasy enough, without becoming that, uh, too. Consider, also, that each and every dungeon master worthy of that title is continually at work expanding his or her campaign milieu. The game is not merely a meaningless dungeon, and an urban base around which is plopped the dreaded wilderness. Each of you must design a world, piece by piece, as if a jigsaw puzzle were being handcrafted, and each new section must fit perfectly the pattern of the other pieces. Faced with such a task, all of us need all of the aid and assistance we can get. Without such help, the sheer magnitude of the task would force most of us to throw up our hands in despair. By having a basis to work with and a well-developed body of work to draw upon, at least part of this task is handled for us. When history... Folklore, myth, fable, and fiction can be incorporated or used as reference for the campaign. The magnitude of the effort required is reduced by several degrees. Even actual sciences can be used. Geography, chemistry, uh, physics, and so forth. Alien viewpoints can be found, of course, but not in quantity, and often not much in quality either. Those works which do not feature mankind in a central role are uncommon. Those which do not deal with men um, at all are scarce indeed. To attempt to utilize any such basis as the central, let alone sole, theme for a campaign milieu is destined to be shallow, incomplete, and totally unsatisfying for all parties concerned, unless the creator is a renaissance man, an all-around universal genius, with a decade or two to prepare the game and milieu. Even then, how can such an effort rival one which borrows from the talents of genius and imaginative thinking which come to us from literature? Gary likes his hyperbole, at least I hope it's hyperbole. I mean, he seems to be saying that if your game centers around everyone being elves or dwarves, then it's a virtually impossible task, which uh, is an odd viewpoint, to say the least. I see people in the uh, chat are keeping track of the milieus. Every time I say milieu, you take a shot. So I think you'd be dead pretty soon.
Having established the why of the humanocentric basis of the game, you will certainly see the impossibility of any lasting success for a monster player character. The environment for adventuring will be built around humans and demi-humans for the most part. Similarly, the majority of participants in the campaign will be human. So unless the player desires a character which will lurk alone somewhere and be hunted by adventurers, there are only a few options open to him or her. A gold dragon can assume human shape, so that is a common choice for monster characters. If alignment is stressed, this might discourage the would-be gold dragon. If it is also pointed out that he or she must begin at the lowest possible value, and only time and the accumulation and retention of great masses of wealth will allow any increase in level, age, the idea should be properly squelched. Even uh, If even that fails, point out that the natural bent of dragons is certainly for their own kind, if not absolute solitude. So what part could a solitary dragon play in a group participation game made up of non-dragons? Dragon non-player characters, yes. As player characters, not likely at all. So I haven't read all the way through original Dungeons and Dragons, although I have read parts of it. And something that stands out to me is that um, this is almost the exact opposite of what he says in original D&D, where he is quite open about the fact that, yeah, let players play anything that they want. They want to be a dragon? Cool, they can be a dragon. Just make sure they start out as a weak dragon and then get tougher. That's about all he has to say in, that, uh, in the original book, if I remember correctly. So this is a complete reversal on his part. As to other sorts of monsters as player characters, you as DM must decide in light of your aims and the style of your campaign. The considered opinion of this writer is that such characters are not beneficial to the game and should be excluded. Note that exclusion is best handled by restriction and not by refusal. Enumeration of the limits and drawbacks which are attendant upon the monster character will always be sufficient to steer the intelligent player away from the monster approach. For in most cases, um, it was only thought of as a likely manner of game domination. The truly experimental type of player might be allowed to play such a monster character for a time so as to satisfy curiosity, and it can then be moved to non-player uh, non status and still be an interesting part of the campaign, and the player is most likely to desire to stop the monster character once he or she has examined its potential and played that role for a time. The less intelligent players who demand a, to play a monster character regardless of obvious consequences will soon remove themselves from play in any event, where their own ineptness will serve to have players or monsters or traps finish them off. <laughs> That's brutal. Basically, if you have players that want to be a monster all the time, they must just be idiots and uh, the game will kill them for you. Uh, so you are virtually on your own with regard to monsters as player characters. You have advice as to why they are not featured, why no details of monster character classes are given herein. The rest is up to you, for when all is said and done, it is your world, and your players must live in it with their characters. Be good to yourself as well as to them, and everyone concerned will benefit from a well-conceived, well-ordered, fairly judged campaign built upon the best of imaginative and creative thinking. So a recurring theme that we're seeing as we're reading this book is that uh, Gary just goes back and forth wildly between saying, really, it's your game. This is really up to you, how you deal with things, and saying, this is definitely not up to you. You're doing it wrong if you don't do it way X, Y, and Z. And he just goes wildly back and forth between those two things. It's really funny. It feels like there was like multiple drafts of this and parts of it were just cobbled together. I don't know. Hard to say. Um, and then, you know, speaking of organization, as I was talking about before, so we go right from monster as a player character to lycanthropy. I guess that's related, right? Because we're going to a type of monster character. But the topics really just kind of go from topic to topic as Gary thinks about them. There is, you know, titles up at the top that help out a little bit. All right, next section is lycanthropy. There have been many different approaches to the disease of lycanthropy. Many are too complicated to understand or are structured so poorly that the were creatures dominates the game. Lycanthropy as a form of player character should be discouraged in a D&D. This can be done by promoting the human attributes instead of the beasts, thus making lycanthropy undesirable 
as it should be. Some players may not realize that any damage over 50% of hit points sustained uh, by bites in a fight with a lycanthrope may cause them to be uh, afflicted by the disease. When this happens, it may be months after the first night of the change um, before the character begins to suspect that lycanthropy has taken hold of his or her being. After that first night, all that will be remembered is that the character was very ill and extremely tired. In the morning, the townspeople will quite possibly be come in the countryside looking for a rampaging lycanthrope. The player character may join in the search for the werebeast, not realizing that he or she is the lycanthrope. After a few months of changing, the adventurer will, or should, begin to suspect that something is wrong. On the nights before the full moon, the lycanthrope will become a withdrawn and a bit edgy, preferring his or her own company, company to that of others, including family. It may be the torn and shredded clothes he or she wakes up in or the mud and scratches on the character's arms and legs that triggers the realization that he or she may be the werebeast the townspeople were searching for. If at all possible, the DM should try to moderate the campaign so that the, player d- uh, the players don't know for several months of game time that the character is now a lycanthrope. That's lame. The DM should try and moderate it so that people don't realize. I mean... If the players don't realize for a while, that can be kind of cool because there's a, a realization there. But actually altering the game world so that they never notice just seems kind of lame. Any human player character, humans are the only beings able to contract lycanthropy. Bitten for 50% or more of his or her natural hit points has a 100% chance of becoming a lycanthrope of the same type that attacked him or her. If the player eats any belladonna within an hour after being bitten, there is a 25% chance the disease will not manifest itself, and thus the character will not be afflicted by it. If not, then a 12th or, uh, or higher level patriarch must be found to administer a cure disease within three days after being bitten. Uh, patriarch, if I remember correctly, is a level of cleric. I forget how high. Really high, I think. Well, it says 12th level, so yeah, pretty high. If the adventurer is only able to find a patriarch of a high enough level after the initial three days, he or she may elect instead to have the priest attempt to uh, a remove curse. This spell must be performed on the player character when he or she is in wear form. The beast will need to make a monster saving throw against magic, and while in wear form, the creature will fight violently to put as much distance as it can um, between it and the patriarch performing the spell. If all this fails, there is still hope. At this point, the player wishes, if the player wishes, to maintain a lycanthrope, to remain a lycanthrope. The two charts given later should be consulted in handling the lycanthrope as a player character. If the adventurer decides to be cured and the methods mentioned thus far uh, have been unsuccessful, he or she may take refuge in a holy slash unholy place, such as a monastery or an abbey. There the clerics can administer uh, to the afflicted one holy slash unholy water, Placed with a goodly amount of wolfsbane and belladonna, prepared by the spiritual methods of that particular religion. This um, po- potation is to be consumed by the victim um, at least twice a day from a silver chalice. No adventuring may be done by the character while he or she is being treated by the clerics. After a month or more, depending on how advanced the disease is, the player character should be cured and somewhat poorer in the purse as this procedure is very costly. The cleric will charge for the cost of the herbs and the holy slash unholy water, as well as for the services rendered. The DM may also wish to include the level of the priest as well um, as the adventurer into the cost of this treatment. If the character has died in a fight with a lycanthrope and is resurrected, the disease will be 100% certain if the cleric raising the adventurer is unaware of the disease or fails to follow the proper procedure to eradicate it. The aforementioned cure will work on the wear-stricken adventurer who has been resurrected. The cleric can use a cure disease, if there is still time, or a remove curse, if there isn't, on the dead adventurer before employing the resurrection spell. If the cleric doesn't take the above safety measures, then it will be necessary to wait until the adventurer becomes a lycanthrope to try to remove curse or use the cure with the herbs and the holy slash unholy water. If the character opts to remain a lycanthrope, many things will need to be taken into consideration, such as the mental anguish caused by the act of changing. Other things, like the conflicting alignments between the character and his or her lycanthrope nature, and what 
uh, his or her family and friends will do once they discover that their friend and loved ones is the werebeast that might have been terrorizing the countryside on the nights of the full moon will have to be determined. Good Lord, these sentences are just like clauses inside clauses. The more extreme the difference in the alignments of the adventure and the beast, the more mental anguish the character will be prone to suffer. For example, a lawful good paladin is bitten by a werewolf, which is a chaotic evil creature. He doesn't discover that he has the disease until it is too late. His mental torment is great, especially when the moon is waxing full, up to the time um, it is full, and then for several days afterwards. The DM may wish to select a mental disorder from the section on insanity for the character to suffer from to reflect the effects of the anguish caused by the disease. The paladin, even after being cured, is no longer a paladin because he is no longer pure enough for that honored state. The DM can elect to have the god send the paladin on a quest in order to restore him to his paladinhood, but it is not recommended. Why is it not recommended? Who can say? No experience points may be gained by a player character while in lycanthrope form. Yikes, that's brutal. If the character is a fighter slash lycanthrope, the fighter will be able to gain levels only as a fighter, never as a lycanthrope. This applies to all classes. The only way a lycanthrope will ever be able to control the change from man uh, to beast is with time measured by full moons. There will be no control of the change into a werebeast for two years of game time, and it will be another year before any control will be gained for the change back into a human. On the nights of a full moon, all lycanthropes with less than three years experience as a werebeast will change into their were form and remain that way from the rise of the moon till dawn. There are other factors besides the full moon that can cause the release of the were creature in a person afflicted with ly lycanthropy. One common cause is stress during a melee. If the character has lost more than a one third of his or her natural hit points during the fight, there's a 50% chance that the wear nature will emerge, causing the player character to be, dis, um, to be disoriented for one to two rounds. Characters with more than two years of experience as a lycanthrope will not suffer this disorientation. During this time, the lycanthrope will be unable to engage in combat. He or she will also sustain damage from the chain as shown on the appropriate table given below. Spells used in the vicinity of a lycanthrope, such as monster summoning, three through uh, seven, conjure animals, and animal summoning three might cause the were nature to be released. It will be up to the DM to decide what spells or magic items could trigger the beast inside the afflicted adventurer. Arguments with other player characters as well as fear could cause the change from man to beast. All lycanthropes will fight and do damage as described in the monster manual, regardless of how long the character has been a lycanthrope. The diseased adventurer will eventually acquire the alignment of the lycanthrope form, if it isn't the same already, within 2 to 12 months. While in wear form, the character will not be interested in any of his or her belongings and will leave them where the change took place. This includes armor and weapons, except for wear rats, who will carry swords. Wear bears are the most powerful form of lycanthrope. As with most, ly most lycanthropes, they will eventually flee to the woods. Once a werebear engages in combat with a creature of an evil alignment, it will fight until it or its opponent is dead. 75% of the time, if a monster with an evil alignment is encountered, the werebear will attack immediately. Werebores are the most foul-tempered of the lycanthropes. Their temperament is such that they will not join a party unless they can be the leader. If they do join one and are not the leader, they will argue bitterly with anyone who disagrees with them. This action may cause them to change into their wear form from the stress involved in the argument. Wear rats will want to live in the city near humans, humans being one of their favorite foods. If a human is captured and not eaten immediately, it will probably be held for ransom. A wear rat will do all that it can to keep the party it is with from discovering that it is a lycanthrope. Wear rats are the only lycanthropes that will carry a sword or use any kind of weapon while in animal form. When the marching order of a party is being decided, a were-rat will almost always volunteer to be in the rear. Were-tigers are usually interested only in what benefits them. They will tolerate other cats to a certain extent, and perhaps even have one for a companion. 
in human form, where tigers can be mistaken for magic users if they have a domesticated cat for an apparent familiar. For this reason, many in AD&D will disguise themselves as a magic user, possibly taking up the trade just enough to give the facade of an appearance of realism. Uh, where tigers might have no qualms about turning on their party, if the party begins to be behave in a manner that the were tiger finds incompatible with his desires. Werewolves are chaotic evil and therefore very unpredictable, especially in a melee. Werewolves tend to run in packs or family units. Seldom will they join a normal party of adventurers, and if they do, once discovered as a lycanthrope, they will turn and attack the party, usually choosing to do so when the adventurers are in combat with another monster. Uh, so this is very odd. These descriptions make sense when you might be talking about an NPC, but it certainly seems like he's saying that if you attract lycanthropy, then your whole personality changes and you need to role play your character completely differently. That's the implication anyway. Not totally sure what he thinks, but it's, it's kind of odd. We have a change table for lycanthropes. This table will, add, will aid the DM in determining the percentage chances of a player character, lycanthrope, changing into and out of wear form. After six years of experience, lycanthropes will be able to control their change at will. So with a waning moon, uh, the odds of changing, or, oh, okay. So with a waning moon, if it's full, half, quarter, or a new moon, you have different percentage chance of changing. And the more years that go by, the more control you have. So that's neat. I think it's a useful table. Uh, there's a damage table. This table shows how much damage a character takes from armor constriction before the straps burst and it falls off during sudden change to lycanthrope form. <laughs> That's funny. So yeah, you're going to take damage if you're wearing armor and you're also a lycanthrope. You'll just explode out of your armor, belt buckles flying. Plate mail is the worst. So you can do up to five damage if you transform while wearing it. People in the comments are saying that I get the feeling that I would have hated to have Gary as a DM. You know, it's really hard to say because I mentioned this in the last stream. From my understanding, the way that Gary actually ran D&D &D was wildly different from a D&D. &D. Like, he didn't use most of these rules. Uh, my understanding was that he typically started characters at third level and he ran the game very fast and loose and made a lot of judgment calls instead of going through all of this and using all of these tables and so on. So I don't know. Obviously, I, I haven't played with him. Um, but that's just what I hear. If you go back, uh, you can dig up a lot of information on this. Uh, he was pretty active on some of the old uh, forums um, before he died. I think Dragon's Foot, perhaps, and maybe one or two other ones. Uh, if you look it up, you can see some of his old forum posts when he would talk to people about the way that uh, he chose to ran D&D. And it was very much like original Dungeons and Dragons, not like a D&D. Uh, a lot of these things here are just to codify the game and make it easier to run tournaments with. Um, so alignment. This is a classic D&D concept. So this is the introduction of the uh, nine-fold uh, alignment chart or alignment axes, which I think shows up in AD&D for the first time. I don't think that the older basic and expert D&Ds or original D&D had the nine-fold system, if I remember correctly. Alignment describes the broad ethos of thinking, reasoning, creatures. Those unintelligent sorts being placed within the neutral area because they are totally uncaring. Note that alignment does not necessarily dictate religious persuasion, although many religious beefs, beliefs will dictate alignment. As explained under alignment languages, this aspect of alignment is not the major consideration. The overall behavior of the character or creature is delineated by alignment, or in the case of player characters, behavior determines actual alignment. Therefore, besides defining the general tendencies of creatures, it also groups creatures into mutually acceptable, or at least non-hostile, divisions. This is not to say that groups of similarly aligned creatures cannot be opposed or even mortal enemies. Two nations, for example, with rulers of lawful good alignment, can be at war. Bands of orcs can hate each other. 
but the former would possibly cease their war to oppose a massive invasion of orcs, just as the latter would make common cause against the lawful good men. Thus, alignment uh, describes the worldview of creatures and helps to define what their actions, reactions, and purposes will be. It likewise causes a player character to choose an ethos which is appropriate to his or her profession. And alignment also aids players in the definition and role approach of their respective game personae. With the usefulness of alignment determined, definition of the divisions is necessary. Major, addition, major divisions. There are two major divisions of four opposite points of view. All four are not mutually exclusive, although each pair is mutually opposed. Law and chaos. The opposition here is between organized groups and individuals. That is, law di dictates that order and organization is necessary and desirable, while chaos holds the opposite view. Law generally supports the group as more important than the individual, while chaos promotes the individual over the group. Good and evil. Basically stated, the tenets of good are human rights, or in the case of AD&D, creature rights. Each creature is entitled to life, relative freedom, and the prospect of happiness. Cruelty and suffering are undesirable. Evil, on the other hand, does not concern itself with rights or happiness. Purpose is the determinant. There can never exist a lawful chaos or an evil good. These and their reverses are dichotomous. This is not to say that they cannot exist in the same character or creature, if it is insane or controlled by another entity, but as a general divisions, they are mutually exclusive pairs. Consider also the alignment graph. If law is opposed to chaos and good to evil, then the radically opposed alignments are lawful neutral, a law, uh, chaotic neutral, neutral good, neutral evil, lawful good, chaotic evil, and lawful evil, chaotic good. Lawful groups might, for example, combine to put down some chaotic threat, for example, such as uh, readily, just as readily as good groups would combine to suppress some powerful evil. Basic understanding and agreement, however, is within the general specific alignment, i.e. one of the nine categories. These are defined as follows. Neutrality. Absolute or true neutral creatures view everything with, uh, which exists as an integral necessary part or function of the entire cosmos. Each thing exists as a part of the whole, one um, as a check or balance on the other, with life necessary for death, happiness for suffering, good for evil, order for chaos, and vice versa. Nothing must ever become predominant or out of balance. Within this naturalistic ethos, humankind preserves, uh, serves a role also, just as all other creatures do. They may be more or less important, but the neutral does not concern itself or her, does not concern himself or herself with these considerations, except where it is positively determined that the balance is threatened. Absolute neutrality is in the central or fulcrum position, quite logically, as the neutral sees all other alignments as parts of a necessary whole. This alignment is the narrowest in scope. It's interesting that it would be the narrowest in scope. The way I've always thought of neutrality is that the vast majority of creatures in the ad and universe would be neutral. Um, but this seems like it's, maybe that's not the case. It's also interesting that law and chaos is distinguished between groups and individuals. Um, my understanding was that, at least in od and the whole law-chaos dichotomy comes from Michael Moorcock's series, where law and chaos aren't really philosophies so much as they are literal forces of nature. There are beings of chaos and beings of order, and they're just locked in this eternal struggle, and the vast majority of um, the world or the universe is just trapped between them. And both of them aren't necessarily good. Uh, they're just forces. And they're both antithetical to life in one way or another. Uh, but here he actually makes law and chaos very much a philosophy. So next we have neutral good. Creatures of this alignment cannot see the cosmos, or creatures of this alignment see the cosmos as a place where law and chaos are are merely tools to use in bringing life, happiness, and prosperity to all deserving creatures. Order is not good unless it brings this to all. Neither is randomness and total freedom desirable if it does not bring such good. Neutral evil. Similar to the neutral good alignment, that of neutral evil holds that neither groups nor individuals have great meaning. This ethos holds that seeking to promote weal for all 
actually brings woe to the truly deserving. Uh, natural forces, which are meant to cull the weak and stupid, are artificially preserved, uh, are artificially suppressed by so called good, and the fittest are wrongfully held back. So, whatever means are expedient can be used by the powerful to gain and maintain their dominance without concern for anything. <laughs> this is funny because I'm just reading this and this just reminds me of the passage a little, couple pages back where he just says, if the characters are too stupid to realize that monster characters are bad, then the game will just kill them in an approving way. So is that paragraph of the text um, neutral evil? I don't know. Uh, next, we have lawful good. Creatures of lawful good alignment view the cosmos with varying degrees of lawfulness or desire for good. They are convinced that order and law are absolutely necessary to assure good, and that good is best defined as whatever brings the most benefit to the greatest number of decent uh, thinking creatures and the least woe to the rest. Lawful neutral. It is the view of this alignment that law and order give purpose and meaning to everything. Without regimentation and strict uh, definition, there be no purpose in the cosmos. Therefore, whether a law is good or evil is of no import, as long as it brings order and meaning. Lawful evil. Obviously, all order is not good, or, uh, nor are all laws beneficial. Lawful evil creatures consider order as the means by which the group is properly placed in the cosmos, from lowest to highest, strongest first, weakest last. Good is seen as an excuse to promote the mediocrity of the whole, and suppress the better and more capable, while lawful evilness allows each group to structure itself and to fix its place as compared to others, serving the stronger, but being served by the weaker. Chaotic good. To the chaotic good individual, freedom and independence are as important to life and happiness. Uh, to the chaotic good individual, freedom and independence are as important to life and happiness. I feel like there's a typo somewhere in there. The ethos views this freedom as the only means by which each creature can achieve true satisfaction and happiness. Law, order, social forms, and anything else which tends to restrict or abridge individual freedom is wrong. And each individual is capable of achieving self-realization and prosperity through himself, herself, or itself. Chaotic neutral. This view of the cosmos holds that absolute freedom is necessary. Whether the individual exercising such freedom chooses to do good or evil is of no concern. After all, life itself is law and order, so death is a desirable end. Therefore, life can only be justified as a tool by which order is combated, and in the end, it too will pass away into entropy. Chaotic evil. The chaotic evil creature holds that individual freedom and choice is important, and that other individuals and their freedoms are unimportant. Uh, if they cannot be held by the individuals through their own strength and merit. Thus, law and order tend to promote not uh, individuals, but groups. And groups suppress individuals, volition, and success. Uh, we have a cool picture here. There is no honor among thieves. I guess that's an example of chaotic evil. Each of these cases for alignment is, of course, stated rather simplistically and ideally, for philosophical and moral reasonings are completely subject subjective according to the acc acculturation of the individual. You, as Dungeon Master, must establish the meanings and boundaries of law and order as opposed to chaos and anarchy, as well as the divisions between right and good as opposed to hurtful and evil. Lawful societies will tend to be highly structured, rigid, well-policed, and bureaucratic, um, and bureaucratic hierarchical bureaucratically hierarchical i feel like there's another typo in there um class rank position and precedence will be important so they will be strictly defined and adhered to on the other hand chaotic uh, areas will have little government and few social distinctions the governed will give their consent to the government acknowledging leaders as equals uh serving those who allowed them to assume leadership obedience and service in a chaotic society is given only by those desiring to do so, or by dint of some persuasion, never by requirement. Alignment with respect to the planes. 
Obviously, the material planes have no set alignments, nor do the other inner planes or the ethereal or astral ones either. So planes haven't even come up in this book. Um, and as someone who has never really been to a and D, I only have kind of a vague idea of how the whole plane system works. So uh, this isn't well organized because I don't know what he's talking about, or I only sort of do. However, the outer planes show various alignments. This is because they are home to creatures who are of like general alignment. If the curves of the alignment table are carried outward to the planes, only those planes at the corners will correspond to non-neutral alignments, i.e. lawful good, chaotic good, chaotic evil, and lawful evil. Similarly, those on the horizontal and vertical axes correspond to the neutral, uh, neutral based alignments, which support an uh, ethos i.e. neutral good, chaotic neutral, neutral evil, and lawful neutral. The remainder of the outer planes are gray areas where alignments shade into each other. Inhabitants of these planes will generally have the same worldview as their fellows on the prime material plane. In the comments, uh, Jeremiah says that the planes have an overview in the player's handbook. I mean, I guess it might as well. And the stuff that ends up in the player's handbook and the stuff that ends up in the DMG seem fairly arbitrary. Uh, graphing alignment. Interestingly, you don't actually see the graph here, right? There's that classic three by three grid that you put alignments on and it's not actually in here. It is of importance to keep track of player character behavior with respect to their professed alignment. Actions do speak far more eloquently than professions, and each activity of a player character should reflect his or her alignment. If a professed lawful evil character is consistently seeking to be helpful and is respecting the lesser creatures, he or she is certainly tending towards good. While if he or she ignores regulations and consistent behavior, the trend is towards chaotic alignment. See Player's Handbook, Appendix 3, Character Alignment Graph. Oh, see, there you go. It's probably in the Player's Handbook. Such drift would be noted by you, and when it takes the individual into a new alignment area, you should then inform the player that his or her character has changed alignment. See, changing alignment. It is quite possible for a character to drift around in an alignment area, making only small shifts due to behavior. However, any major action which is out of alignment um, which is out of alignment character, maybe means character alignment there, will cause a major shift to the alignment which is directly in line with the actions. I.e., if a lawful character um, def defies the law in order to aid the cause, expressed or implied, of chaotic good, he or she will be either lawful neutral or chaotic neutral, depending on the factors involved in the action. It is of utmost importance to keep a rigid control of alignment behavior with respect to such characters as serve sort of deities who will accept only certain alignments, those who are paladins, those with evil familiars, and so on. Part of the role they have accepted requires a set behavior mode, and its, be and its benefits are balanced by this. Therefore, failure to demand strict adherence to alignment behavior is to allow a game abuse. Lawful good characters should not be allowed to ignore unlawful or shady actions by looking the other way. If, for example, a party that includes a paladin decides to use poison on a monster they know is ahead, the DM uh, shouldn't let the paladin be distracted or led away for a few rounds when it is patently obvious that the paladin heard the plan. If the player does not uh, take appropriate measures to prevent the action, the DM should warn the paladin that his lack of action will constitute a voluntary alignment change and then let the chips fall where they may. So it seems like there are more consequences for alignment in AD&D than in other versions of the game where it seems to be mostly flavor. But the big uh, factor seems to be um, the way that it affects deities. For other characters, I'm not sure what other big game effects it would have apart from just you know describing uh, your general personality. Although I suppose alignment languages, which is our next section, we'll get into that. Alignment language is a handy game tool, which is not unjustifiable in real terms. I like how he starts out right away by just justifying it, since I'm pretty sure that this is one of those concepts 
which from very early on, people were just like, what? Thieves did employ a special cant. Secret organizations and societies did and do have certain recognition, recognition signs, signals, and recognition phrases, possibly special languages of limited extent as well. Consider also the medieval Catholic Church, which used Latin as a common recognition and communication base to cut across national boundaries. In AD&D, alignment languages are the special set of signs, signals, gestures, and words which intelligent creatures use to inform other intelligent creatures of the same alignment of their fellowship and common ethos. Alignment languages are never flaunted in public. They are not used as salutations or interrogatives if the speaker is uncertain of the alignment of those addressed. Furthermore, alignment languages are of limited vocabulary and deal with the ethos of the alignment in general, so lengthy discussion of varying subjects cannot be conducted in such tongues. My question is, how do you learn the alignment language, right? Does someone have to teach it to you? If you have an alignment shift, do you just suddenly know this new language? Not sure. Um, let's see here. Each alignment language is, con is constructed to allow recognition of like aligned creatures and to discuss the precepts of the alignment in detail. Otherwise, the tongue will permit only the most rudimentary communication with a vocabulary limited to a few score words. The speaker could inquire of the listener's state of health, ask about hunger, thirst, or degree of tiredness. A few other basic conditions and opinions could be expressed, but no more. The um, specialty tongues of druids and the thieves can't are designed to handle conversations pertaining to things druidical on the one hand and thievery, robbery, and disposal of stolen goods on the other. Druids could discuss at length and in detail the state of the crops, weather, animal husbandry, and foresting. But warfare, politics, and venturing in like manner would be impossible to detail with the language. Any character foolish enough to announce his or her alignment in, um, by publicly crying out in that alignment tongue will incur, incur considerable social sanctions. At best, he or she will be thought uh, unmannerly, rude, boorish, and stupid. Those of the same alignment will be inclined to totally ignore the character, not wishing to embarrass themselves by admitting any familiarity with the offender. Those of other alignment will likewise regard the speaker with distaste when overhearing such an outburst. At worst, the character will be marked by those hostile to the alignment in which he or she spoke. Alignment language is used to establish credentials only after initial communications have been established by other means. Only in the most desperate of situations would any creature utter something not would or would utter something in the alignment language, uh, alignment tongue. Otherwise, it must also be noted that alignment does not necessarily empower a creature to actually speak or understand the alignment language, which is central, which is general in the ethos. Thus, blink dogs are intelligent, lawful, good creatures who have a language of their own. A lawful, good human, dwarf, or brownie will be absolutely at a loss to communicate with blink dogs. However, except in the most limited of ways, non-aggression, uh, non-fear, etc., without knowledge of the creature's language or some magical means. This is because blink dogs, blink dogs do not intellectually embrace the ethos of lawful good, but are of that alignment instinctually. Therefore, they do not speak the language used by lawful good. This is not true of gold dragons, let us say, or red dragons with respect to their alignment, who do speak their respective alignment languages. Hmm. Now the question is, it seems to imply that you can only speak an alignment language if you are that alignment. It's not, I'm not sure how that is supposed to happen though. Like can, if you're a lawful good character, can you speak in the you know lawful evil alignment language? Would you know those terms or how do you learn those terms, right? That's the actual thing that I'm interested in here. How are these languages built into the world in a concrete sense? Changing alignment. Whether or not the character actively professes some deity he or she will have an alignment and serve one or more deities of this general alignment indirectly and unbeknownst to the character. 
Changing of alignment is a serious matter. Although some players would have their characters change alignment as often as they change socks. Not so. First, change of alignment for clerics can be very serious, as it might cause a change of deity. See day-to-day -day acquisition of cleric spells. If a druid changes his or her alignment, that is, because other than neutral becomes other than neutral, then he or she is no longer a druid at all. Change of alignment will have an adverse effect on any class of character if he or she is above second level. Immediately upon alignment change actually occurring, the character concerned will lose one level of experience. Wow. Dropping experience points to take him or her to the very beginning of the next lower level. Losing the hit die and or hit points and all abilities which accrued to him or her with the lost level. If the alignment change is involuntary, such as that caused by a powerful magic, a curse, etc., then the character can regain all of the losses, level, hit die, etc., upon returning to his or her former alignment as soon as possible and after making atonement through a cleric of the same alignment and sacrificing treasure, which has a value of not less than 10,000 gold pieces per level of experience of the character. The sacrificial amount is variable, so use your best judgment um, as to the total and what and where it should go. Magic items to build up the NPC cleric, money out of the campaign, uh, magic items out of the campaign, etc. Similarly, such atonement and sacrifice can be accomplished by a quest. Note that, in all likelihood, the character will desire to retain the new alignment, and it is incumbent upon you as DM to ensure that the player acts accordingly. Some equally powerful means, divine intervention, remove curse, etc., must be used to restore the original alignment before atonement can begin. So, if there's an alignment change, it's always bad, it looks like, and, and really, really bad, especially if you're at a high level. This is unfortunate. It feels like it really locks players into a particular game style, right? Following your alignment doesn't seem to have a lot of benefits, um, but not following your alignment has tremendous drawbacks. So the guess, at least at first glance, seems to be that uh, the alignment system is there in order to fairly rigidly enforce uh, player behavior into certain predefined molds, which doesn't sound like a lot of fun to me. I don't know. Uh, characters who knowingly or unknowingly change alignment through forethought or actions permanently lose the experience points and level due to disfavor. They must also accept a severe disability in alignment language. They must also accept a severe disability in alignment language. Uh, during a one-level transitional period. Okay, there we go. Until the character has, again, achieved his or her former level of experience held prior to change of alignment, he or she will not be able to converse in the former alignment's tongue, nor will anything nor will anything but the crudest signaling be possible in the new alignment language. Although it is possible for a character to allow himself or herself to be blown by the winds as far as alignment is concerned, he or she will pay a penalty which will effectively damn the character to oblivion. A glance at the alignment chart will show that radical alignment change is impossible without magical means. If one is chaotic good, it is possible to change to neutral good or chaotic neutral only, depending upon desire and or actions. From the absolute neutral uh, alignment, one can move to some neutral based alignment. This represents the fact that the character must divorce himself or herself from certain precepts and views and wholeheartedly embrace another set of values. And human nature is such that without radical personality alteration, such as caused by insanity or magic in the case of this game, such transition must be gradual. It is assumed that the character's initial alignment has been his or hers for a considerable period prior to the character's uh, emergence as an adventurer. This ethos will not be lightly changed by a stable, rational individual. It is recommended that you do not inform players of the penalty which will occur when alignment change. What? That's just mean. So that those who seek to use alignment as a means of furthering their own interests will be conveniently, um, by conveniently swapping from one to another when they deem the time is ripe, will find that they have instead paid a stern price for fickleness. Come on, Gary. Come on.
Yeah, so you tell players that there is an alignment system, they make an alignment, and then later on they change their alignment and you just like slam them with, with a one level penalty. Not a great idea. It's also a little odd that is, he seems to indicate you can change all over the place with alignment in theory. And then he says that you can't. So I'm not really sure which it is. It says, although it is possible for character to allow himself to be blown by the winds of alignment, um, by, to be blown by the winds as far as alignment is concerned. So you can just go all over the place. But then radical alignment change is not possible. So I don't know which of those is really true. Uh, and what happens if you're like a lawful good character, but then you just like start, you know, slaughtering civilians? Well, it's not going to make you like a neutral good character or a, you know, um, or something like that. It's not going to move you like one step. You seem to be saying that if you start out on the good end of the spectrum, you simply can't move to the evil end. Uh, I don't know. It's, it's weird because this book is so verbose. There are so many words, but there's oftentimes these weird gaps where it's hard to figure out how something would actually work. Uh, next section is money. Player characters starting money. The amount of funds which each character begins with is kept low to prevent the game from becoming too easy. Players learn from the beginning that they are never able to obtain all of the goods that they would like in order to feel safe and satisfied. Explain to players that sums um, they begin with, see player's handbook, money, represent inherited monies and savings. A magic user, for example, is said to expend most ready uh, cash he or she possessed on training. Monks or ascetics who don't care uh, about material possessions in any event, so they do not accumulate much money prior to becoming adventurers and treasure seekers. If you have a difficult campaign and you opt to bestow a limited number of special items, to player characters at the beginning of the game, a potion, a magic goodie, such as a plus one dagger, or even something um, as mundane as a family suit of plate mail, you should adjust starting money accordingly. The game is always supposed to be a challenge to cause players to want for something and to wish to adventure with their characters in order to obtain the desired things. Remembering that good players will be able to gain from nearly any successful encounter, there will always be some armor or weapons or equipment to be gained from an adventure. You should not hesitate to be stingy and tight right from the beginning of a campaign. See, I mean, he says that, but the way that AD&D works is a lot of your XP comes from treasure hunting. And so even after the first level or two, you're probably going to have hundreds or thousands of gold pieces. So the whole you know, equipment struggle where you're low on equipment at the beginning, that seems to end very, very quickly. As you quickly get overflowing with, you're overflowing with cash and you can basically buy any basic equipment that you might desire. So player character expenses. Each player character will automatically expend not less than 100 gold pieces per level of experience per month. Huh, that's interesting. This is simply support, upkeep, equipment, and entertainment expense. These costs are to be deducted by the dungeon master automatically, and any further spending by the PC is to be added to these costs. Such expense is justified by the fact that adventurers are a freewheeling and high living lot, except of course for monks. Other miscellaneous expenditures by player characters encompass such things as additional equipment expense for henchmen or hirelings, cost of hirelings, bribes, cost of locating prospective henchmen, and so on. To these costs, um, to such costs are to be added uh, maintenance of henchmen, 100 gold piece per level per month, maintenance of stronghold, 1% of the total cost of Stronghold per month. This is in addition to all treasure shares in regard to uh, henchmen. Finally, any taxation or other levies must be taken into consideration, along with contributions to the player's character's religious organization. 
All of these costs will help assure that the PCs have a keen interest in going out and adventuring in order to support themselves and their many associates and holdings. You may reduce costs according to prevailing circumstances if you feel it is warranted, but even so doing but even so doing should not give rise to excess funds on hand in the campaign. Hmm. He seems to be indicating that you need to keep players poor one way or another. Value and reputed properties of gems and jewelry. Gems. The base value of gems found in a treasure can be determined in whole or by lots of five or ten stones by rolling percentile dice. We have a little chart here where you can roll dice and figure out how much your gems are worth. Uh, value of a gem depends upon its type, quality, and weight. A huge semi-precious stone, carnelian, for example, is worth as much as an average gemstone, quality being equal. Size may vary from stone to stone, a 50 gold piece ornamental stone being of above average size, while a 50 gold piece gemstone would most likely be very small. Ooh, we're into a heavy table page here. Uh, in the comments, someone says, yes, keep them poor uh, to keep them adventuring. Think Conan or Fawford. I mean, I agree. Um, his system is just seems a little clunky. I know that today it's pretty popular to use something like um, partying or revelry. I forgot the exact term is, is slipping my mind. But basically, when players come back to town, you can have them get extra XP by blowing huge amounts of gold on parties and just partying and throwing giant feasts and acting like a sword and sorcery adventurer. And you give them more XP to encourage them to do that. And then you can like build adventure hooks into things that happen after the party. So I think that system's a little bit more fun. But yeah, it is a good way to keep them poor. Instead of, um, I mean, the way that he recommends is that you just have elaborate taxation schemes, which uh, sounds boring. Seems like there's better ways you could do that. Although the, you know, the system that he implies of uh, just upkeep, where if you have a adventurer that is, you know, building a castle or hiring um, henchmen, then you're just going to be drained of money slowly over time. That also makes sense. It sort of abstracts the um, partying aspect into just something that happens without you actually intending to do it. So increase or decrease of worth beyond base value. If you do not place specific value on each gem in a treasure, uh, showing rather the base value of each gem instead, then variation in the worth of each stone should be allowed. This variation will generally result in some increase, although there is a chance for a decreasing value as well. See below. To find if a gem increases in value, roll a d10 for each stone and consult the table below. So you roll a die, and this can alter the value of your gem. 1 through 10... When base value is known, use the table above and roll for each stone. Stones which for which a 1 or a 0 is rolled must be diced for again on the table, but all other others are excluded from such rolls. If large numbers of stones are in question, it's suggested that they be diced for in groups in order to make the process less time-consuming. This whole thing sounds really time-consuming. There's got to be a faster way to do this. Uh, key to gem properties. Ornamental stones. Oh, so you can really see uh, Gary going through the encyclopedia or the thesaurus here looking up for precious stones. Honestly, I did this too uh, when I was writing some of the tables for Maze Rats and I wanted lots of different types of um, gemstones or like precious materials. I was definitely looting the encyclopedia as well. So we have things like azurite, banded agate, blue quartz, uh, hematite, lapis lazuli, lapis lazuli, I think is how you say it. Uh, malachite, moss agate, obsidian, um, and so on, with a little description of it. This is actually kind of nice, because in a lot of old-fashioned uh, early D&D &D modules, you'll often get collections of gems, and it'll say that you get, you know, a lump of malachite. And this actually has a description of what that looks like. Fancy stones, all the way up to amber, alexandrite, amethysts, uh, garnets, jades, pearls, topaz, and so on. We have gemstones worth a thousand or more gold pieces, black opals, black sapphires, diamonds, emeralds, uh, fire opals, rubies, sapphires, and so on. Uh, jewelry. 
The base value of jewelry is determined by percentile dice roll, just as with gems. Roll a die, figure out what it's worth. Go all the way up to 12,000 gold pieces. So that might be a platinum uh, jewelry with gems on it. Once jewelry's base value is determined, each piece should be checked for workmanship and design by rolling a 10-sided die. Each one rolled indicates the piece of jewelry in question is of exceptional value and thus um, either goes with the highest possible value in its class or to the next highest class, where its base value is redetermined and its workmanship and design are again checked. Any piece of jewelry set with gems must also be checked for the possibility of an exceptional stone in the setting. Any score of one on an eight-sided die indicates that the value of the piece of jewelry increases by 5,000 gold pieces. And these exceptional pieces are further checked by rolling a six-sided die, each successive one doubling the increase. For example, 10,000, 20,000, 40,000, 80,000 gold pieces to a maximum of uh, 640,000 gold pieces. The dungeon master can, of course, name what each piece of jewelry is, bracelet, brooch, crown, earrings, necklace, uh, pendant, ring, tiara, etc., giving its substance and the number and value of its stones. We have a table of reputed magical properties of gems. That's really cool. I like this. It's kind of a, there's a world building thing to it. For example, agate, it gives you restful or safe sleep. Alexandrite is good omens. Amber it wards off uh, diseases. Amethyst prevents drunkenness or drugging. Barrel wards off foes. Bloodstone is weather control. Carbuncle, powers of dragon sight. Carnelian, protection from evil. Cat's eye agate, uh, protection from spirits. Uh, Chalcedony, hopefully I'm saying that right, wards off undead. Chriso barrel, protection from possession. Chrysolite, wards off spells. Uh, Chriso praise is invisibility. Coral, Calms the weather, safety in river crossing, cures madness, and staunches bleeding. Wow, coral's great. Uh, diamond, invulnerability versus undead. Uh, hematite, aids fighters and heals wounds. Um, jacinth. Luck traveling, wards off plague, protection from fire. Jade, skill at musical and uh, musical instruments. Jasper, protection from venom. Uh, jet, soul object material. Lapis lazuli, raises morale and courage. Malachite, protection from falling. Malachite and Sunstone, wards off spells, evil spirits, and poisons. Moonstone, causes lycanthropy. That's probably the first bad effect that we've seen here. Uh, Olivine, protection from spells. Onyx, causes discord amongst enemies. Uh, the Peridot, Peridot, maybe it's Peridot, wards off enchantments. Ruby, gives good luck. Sapphire, aids understanding of problems, kills spiders, boosts magical abilities. Ooh. Sapphire, star, protection from magic. Sard, benefits wisdom. Serpentine, aids to wile and cunning. Topaz, wards off evil spirits. Turquoise, aids horses in all ways. The stone shatters when it operates. Um, and we have a list of colors here. Black means the earth, darkness, and negation. Blue means the heavens, truth, spirituality. Clear is the sun, luck. Uh, green is Venus, a reproduction, sight, resurrection. Red means hemorrhaging control and heat. White is the moon, enigmatic. And yellow is secrecy, homeopathy, and jaundice. So there's no real... Um, wait, let's go into here. Uh, re regardless of what qualities, gems, herbs, and other substances are purported to possess, the mere possession of a score of a type of gem or a bale of some herb will convey absolutely no benefit of a magical nature to the character concerned. These special qualities are given herein merely as information for dungeon master use in dev devising special formula for potions, inks, etc. The information might also prove useful in other ways, particularly with regard to description of magic items, laboratories, and so on. Under no circumstances should you allow some players to convince you to the contrary. We have uh, values for other rare commodities, beaver, ermine, fox, and so on, where you can roll to adjust their value. So I suppose you become a hunter or a trapper. So what I like about this section right here, talking about the effects of, or the reputed magical properties of gems, is that uh, it doesn't have any explicit effects like he says here. But by giving this kind of world building information, then you can work it into other aspects of the game. 
I think that's really neat. I like that a lot. Get a drink here and check on the chat. All right, let's move on to armor, armor class, and weapons. Can't wait till we get into all the halberds. Or is that in the player's handbook? All the pole arms. Gary was famously obsessed with uh, different types of pole arms. So we have armor, armor class, and weapons, types of armor, and encumbrance. The encumbrance factor for armor does not consider weight alone. It also takes into account the distribution of the weight of the armor and the relative mobility of the individual wearing the protective material. Therefore, weights for armor shown below are adjusted weights, and base movement speed is likewise shown. So we have a weight in pounds and your movement speed for the different types of armor on this little table. Uh, next, we have armor types. So banded mail is a layered armor with padding, light chain, and a series of overlapping bands of armor in vulnerable areas. Weight is somewhat distributed. Chain mail is padding plus interlocking mesh armor covering the upper and lower body. Vulnerable areas have multiple thicknesses. Weight falls upon the shoulders and waist of the wearer. Chain elfin is a finely wrought suit of chain which is of thinner links but stronger metal. It is obtainable only from elven kind who do not sell it. Leather armor is shaped queer bully. Leather hardened by immersion in boiling oil. Uh, curious and shoulder pieces and softer shirt and leggings. Padded armor is heavily padded, quilted coat, and an additional soft leather uh, jerkin and leggings. Plate mail is light chain with pieces of plate. Curios, shoulder pieces, elbow and knee guards, and greaves. Weight is well distributed. Plate armor is a full suit of plate, which is no more weighty and a bit less bulky, considering uh, what is known as field plate. If you allow such armor in your campaign, use the same weight, but with a 9-inch movement base and a base armor class of 2 sans shield. Such armor would be very expensive, about 2,000 gold pieces. Ring mail is relatively soft leather armor over padding. To the long coat of leather are sewn metal rings. This makes the coat rather heavy and bulky. Scale mail is armor similar to ring mail, but overlapping scales of metal are sewn to both coat and leggings, or a skirted coat is worn. As with chain, weight falls mainly on the wearer's shoulders and waist. Shield large. Includes such shields as the large Viking round shields or the Mormon the Norman kite shields. They are made of wood covered with leather and bordered with a soft iron banding at the edges. Shield small is a typical kite and heater shields or small round shields constructed as a large shield or else made of metal, more rare by far. Shields small wooden is the same as other shields, but it lacks the metal binding and reinforcement, so it will be more easily split. Is there rules for breaking shields in this game? I don't know. Splint mail consists of light chain, greaves, and a leather coat into which are laminated vertical pieces of plate with shoulder guards. Studded leather is leather armor to which have been fastened metal studding as additional protection, usually including an outer coat of fairly close set studs, small plates. Helmets. It is assumed that an appropriate type of head armoring will be added to the suit of armor in order to allow uniform protection of the wearer wearing of a great helm as the appropriate weight and restricts vision to the front 60 degrees only. But it gives the head AC 1. Now this is advanced Dungeons and Dragons, which means that lower AC is better. AC 1 is really good. If a helmet is not worn, one blow in six will strike at the AC 10 head, unless the opponent is intelligent, in which case one blow in two will be aimed at the AC 10 head. DC 6, 1 through 3, equals a head blow. Wow. So if you're fighting... I'm reading this right. If you're fighting an intelligent opponent and you're not wearing a helmet, 
then half of the time they're going to aim for your head. And they're going to have a pretty easy time hitting it since AC 10 is, I think, the worst level of armor that you can have in this game. Magic armor. When magic armor is worn, assume that its properties allow movement at the next higher base rate and that weight is cut by 50%. There is no magical elfin chain mail in italics. I wonder why that's so important. Magic shields. Magic shields are no less likely are no less weighty than their non-magical counterparts, but they are non-bulky with respect to encumbrance. Shield use. A shield is basically a barrier between its wielder and his or her opponents. It is used to catch blows or missiles. It can also be used offensively to strike or push an opponent. The shield can be used fully only to the left or front of the right-handed individual. Attacks from the right flank or the rear negate the benefits of a shield. Small shields. Bucklers and other small shields, which are basically held with one hand, are moved rapidly by the wielder, but they can cover only a small area, so they are less effective by and large. So, such shields are less cumbersome and fatiguing in employment, however, so no distinction is made between a small and a normal-sized shield in AD&D. Large shields. Although a large shield such as a Norman kite shield or a large Viking round shield covers much more of the body, employing one of these shields is far more difficult as they are cumbersome and fatiguing. Therefore, large shields are treated as but plus one to armor class rating without a shield. Optionally, you may allow them to add plus two to this armor class rating with respect to small, non-war engine or giant hurled missiles. If you do so, however, be certain that you also keep careful track of encumbrance. That would be a pain if you had to keep track of different kinds of armor class for different types of um, attacks. I know some people have done it. I think Pathfinder does it, but it'd be a pain. So next we have Dexterity Armor Class Bonus. This bonus is in addition to that given by any other form of protection. The type of armor worn by the character with the Dexterity Armor Class bonus does not adversely affect this bonus, for it is assumed that his or her physical conditioning and training compensate otherwise. This is particularly applicable with regard to magic armor, which is assumed to possess an enchantment which makes it both light and flexible. The penalty for wearing armor is already subsumed in the defensive bonuses given for it, and if it were further to penalize the character by denying Dexterity Armor Class adjustments, it would be totally invalid. Modifiers to Dexterity Armor Class Adjustment Neither penalty nor bonus due to Dexterity, the defensive adjustment, is considered when the character is subjected to the following attack forms. Attacks from the rear flank, rear, or strikes from behind, where the character is virtually unable to see the attack coming. Large missiles, such as those hurled by a giant or some form of engine, where the trajectory and speed and size of the missile negate dexterity considerations. Magical attacks by spell, device, breath, breath weapon, gaze, etc. Note that defensive adjustments do apply to saving throws for these attack forms. Weapon types to hit adjustment note. If you allow weapon type adjustments in your campaign, please be certain to remember that these adjustments are for weapons versus specific types of armor, not necessarily against actual armor class. In most cases, monsters are not wearing armor, monsters not wearing armor will not have any weapon type adjustment allowed as monster armor class in such cases pertains to the size, shape, agility, speed, and or magical nature of the creature. Not excluded from this, for example, would be an iron golem. However, monsters with horny or bony armor might be classed as plate mail if you so decide, but uh, do so on a case-by-case -case basis. Naturally, monsters wearing armor will be subject to weapon type to hit adjustments. <coughs> Excuse me. So it doesn't really um, list out how this works here, but perhaps later on, from what I understand, um, AD&D to have a system where um, if you had different types of weapons, you could gain bonuses or penalties based on the type of armor that the opponent was wearing. So certain weapons would be more effective against certain types of armor. 
uh, which is a neat idea. Um, my understanding is that very few people ever used it just because it's fiddly and hard to keep track of. But it's one of those things where for a more detailed, realistic game, you could see it being fun. It is really interesting how near the beginning of this book, Gary is very uh, careful to point out how this game is about fun, you know, high speed, freewheeling, you know, sword and sorcery adventure. Um, and not supposed to be a simulation of, of anything realistic. And then the book immediately goes into just pages of very dense simulation type mechanics. So there's there's always this conflict at the heart of this book, I, I feel like, where it's not totally sure what it is. Our next section is hirelings. So we have uh, standard hirelings. Most hirelings are dealt with under the section entitled, entitled Expert Hirelings, those which are typically employed at such time as the character in question has an established stronghold. Common, standard hirelings are basically the usual craftsmen or laborers taken on by low-level player characters. Men-at-arms, soldiers of mercenary calling, are dealt with under Expert Hirelings. Typical standard hirelings are, you have things like bearers and porters, carpenters, leather workers, uh, limners, link boys, masons, pack handlers, tailors, teamsters, and valets slash lackeys. These all have a daily cost and a monthly cost. Uh, a bearer or a porter. These individuals are laborers who will carry whatever is directed. Each is able to carry up to 50 pounds individually or double that with a carrying pole or litter or the like. Carpenter. This occupation assumes most woodworking jobs. A carpenter might be hired to secure a portal, fashion a chest, etc. Leather worker. This occupation is principally concerned with the fabrication of leather goods, such as backpacks, belts, straps, horse tack, etc. Limners. These in individuals do all sign painting, drawing of heraldic devices, etc. That's funny. That's a fun word. I like it. A limner. I'm going to hire a limner and make myself an awesome family crest. Uh, mason. Any stonework must be done by a mason, and this occupation subsumes plasterers as well. Pack handler. These individuals are trained at loading, handling, and unloading beasts of burden, such as donkeys, mules, horses, etc. Tailor. This occupation makes and repairs clothing, bags, shield covers, etc. It also subsumes hatters. Teamster. Uh, teamsters are basically drivers of carts and wagons. They will also load and unload their vehicles. They are expert animal handlers with respect to their uh, particular specialty of draft animal only. For example, horses, mules, oxen, or whatever. Ballet slash lackey. This occupation subsumes the various forms of body servants and messengers. Location of standard hirelings. In general, the various occupations represented here are common to most settlements of village size and above although each and every village will not be likely to furnish each and every sort of common hireling. Towns and cities will have money available, and each sort will be found in the appropriate section or quarter of the city or town. Employment of standard hirelings. This requires the location of the desired individual and the offer of work. If the employment is only for a few days, there will be no real difficulty in locating individuals to take on the job. If the offer is for long-term employment, only one in six will be willing to accept unless a small bonus is offered. A day's wage is too small, but double or treble that is sufficient to make three in six willing to take service. Duties. It is not practical to try and determine the time and expenses necessary to accomplish everything possible for the scores of standard hirelings possible to employ. So each DM will have to decide. For example, assume that a player character hires a tailor to make plain blue cloaks for all of his or her henchmen. This will take only about one day per garment and cost the, st the stated amount of money plus five copper pieces, 10% of the cost of the cloak, per cloak for materials. However, if the same cloaks were to be fashioned of a material of unusual color and have some device also sewn upon them, time and material costs would be at least double standard and probably more. What I really like about AD and in general is the way that it's kind of zoomed out in a way that is not really true with uh, modern D&D. &D. 
So instead of just having one character and being focused on that one character to the exclusion of everything else, um, in AD&D, you're, you're very much creating like teams. You have hirelings, um, you have you know combat hirelings, you can hire soldiers to work with you. We can also just hire random guys, craftsmen, people to make you cloaks. So there's this zoomed out feel of it where you're running a team or like a small organization. And that allows for um, a level of strategy and just a, a level of engagement in the world, I feel like, that gets lost in games that are just relentlessly focused on one PC. Plus, the, the type of games where it's just one PC only, um, it tends to make the players get highly invested in their character to the extent where they get the impression that the game is all about those characters and they um, can feel really bad if their characters die as a result. Whereas with this kind of zoomed out view, you have the sense more that your character is just one of many people. So if they die, you might be really attached to them and that's sad, but the game will go on. You can either get an NPC and turn them into a, a PC or, or something similar. And it's more about the story of the group, of the enterprise, rather than of one individual. Um, expert hirelings. If henchmen are defined as the associates, companions, and loyal, to some degree, followers of a player character, hirelings are the servitors, mercenaries, and employees of such player characters. And they too can have some degree of loyalty based on their accommodations, rate of remuneration, and treatment. Various hirelings of menial nature are assumed to come with the cost of maintaining a stronghold. Thus, um, cooks, lackeys, stable boys, sweepers, and various servants are no concern of the player character. Guards and special hirelings are, however, and such persons must be located and enlisted by the PC for his or her NPC henchmen. Location of expert hirelings. Most expert hirelings can be found only in towns or cities, although some might be located in smaller communities, provided that they are willing to pick up and relocate, of course. Employment is a matter of offer and acceptance, and each player character must do his or her own bargaining. The various types of hirelings listed below will generally be found in the appropriate section of the community. The Street of Smiths, Weapons Way, Armors Alley, etc. Or at cheap inns in the case of mercenary soldiers. Monthly costs. The cost of each type of expert hireling is shown in the list. This amount is based on the associated expenditures which go with the position salary or wage, uniform or clothing, housing, food, and sundry equipments used routinely by the hireling. Exception. The cost does not include arms and armor of soldiers, and these items must be furnished to mercenaries over and above other costs. Certain other hirelings incur costs over and above the normal also when they engage in their occupations. These are indicated on the table by an asterisk. So some of these expert hirelings include alchemists, armorers, blacksmith, engineer architects, engineer artillery, artillerists. I know I'm saying that wrong. Engineer sapper slash miner, jeweler, gem cutter, mercenary soldier of a wide variety of types. Uh, we have a sage, scribe, ship crew, ship master, spy, steward, castellan, and weapon maker. Um, so we have a description of occupations and professions. Alchemist. This profession handles the compounding of magical substances, and the advantages uh, of employing such an alchemist are detailed under the section, Fabrication of Magic Items, Potions. Alchemists can, will only be found in cities unless you specially, specifically locate one elsewhere. It will require an offer of 10 to 100 gold pieces, bonus money plus a well-stocked laboratory, plus the assurance of not less than a full year of employment to attract one to service. Armor. This occupation cares for and manufactures armor and shields. One armor is always required for every 40 soldiers or fraction thereof in the employee of a player character, and only spare time can be spent on the manufacture of items. For example, that fraction of the normal month not spent caring for equipment of troops can be used to make armor, helmets, and or shields. Uh, prorating time according to the number of men. Uh, zero equals 100%, one through five, 85%, six through 10, 70%, etc. This includes the armor and the apprentices, which are assumed to be present and cared, and cared for by the cost shown. 
A workroom and forge costing 100, 310 to 400 gold pieces must be available for an armorer, and the skill of the armorer must be determined if armor is to be fashioned. Hmm. Uh, 1 through 50 skill level equal to ring, scale, or studded. Uh, 51 through 75 skill uh, equal to above plus splint mail. 76 to 90 skill level equal to all of the above plus chain. 91 to 100 skill level equal to any sort of armor. If items are to be made, the following times are suggested for an armorer and apprentices working exclusively, assuming a one-week period in order to set the operation in motion before actual work begins. Armorers occupied for any part of the month with caring for the equipment of troops must increase time proportionally. We have a table here, different types of armor and how long it takes to make things. Plate mail can take up to 90 days, which I think is fairly realistic. Dwarven armors are twice as efficient, but cost three times as much and they will not generally label labor for anyone beyond one year of service. Gnomish armorers are one and a half times more efficient than humans and cost twice as much. Dwarves add 25% to any uh, to skill level roll, gnomes 10%. Elvish armorers cost five times the normal rate, and they will fashion only normal chain mail for sale. But it is of the highest quality, and they make it in half the time a human would. Blacksmith. There must be a blacksmith in any stronghold, and he and his assistants can care for the needs of up to 40 men or horses. Another smith is required for each additional 160 men or horses, or fraction thereof. Besides the usual duties, horseshoes, nails, hinges, and miscellaneous bits and pieces, a hired smith can turn out some weaponry each month. Each must have a workroom with bellows and forge. Uh, 30 arrowheads or quarrel tips, or 10 spear heads, or five morning stars, or two flails or pole arm heads. Uh, dwarven smiths are three times more efficient and cost 10 times as much. Oh, I see, smiths as opposed to armors. Gnomish smiths are twice as efficient and cost four times as much. Engineer architect, the profession dealing with above ground construction and fortification. In order to build any structure more complex than a simple hut or barn, it is necessary to hire one. An engineer architect is paid for whole months of employment, even if the work is completed in less than a whole month. He or she also collects the additional fee equal to 10% of the total expenditure of the construction. The building site must be selected or approved by an engineer architect, or else there is a 75% chance the structure will collapse in one to 100 months. We have an engineer artiller artillerist. I think that's right. This profession deals with the construction and use of siege artillery, catapults, trebuchets, etc. No such engines can be made or properly used without the services of such an individual. If employment is for short term only, say a few months or less, then rates of pay and cost will be increased from 10% to 60%. Engineer, sapper, slash miner. All underground construction or tunneling, as well as siege operations, which, which require mining, countermining, uh, siege equipment, picks, rams, sows, uh, towers, etc., or trenches, ditches, uh, parapets, and so forth, require the professional services of an engineer, sapper, slash miner. Dwarves are useful in the capacity of engineer, uh, miner only. They are twice as costly and add 20% to the efficiency of human miners. And dwarven miners will work for only a will work only for a dwarven minor engineer, of course. Jewelers and gem cutters. This profession allows the character to have rapid and accurate appraisal of any precious metal, gem material, or piece of jewelry, except those which you, as DM, specifically designate as heretofore unknown. In addition, the jeweler gem cutter can set stones in various things, sword hilts, flagons, or whatever, or fashion jewelry from gem material and precious metals. A simple ring will take a week, a bracelet with sculpting two weeks, with stones set three, while a crown might take a full year of work. 
Basically, the work merely adds either splendor to the player character's personage um, by the display, or the total value of the materials can be increased um, by from 10% to 40%, depending on the skill of the individual doing the work. Likewise, as a gem cutter, the individual might well increase the value of a rough or poorly cut stone, those under 5,000 gold piece base value, or the stone might be ruined in the process. Note that jeweler gem cutters cannot be held responsible for damage. Both functions are shown below. We have a, you can roll for a jeweler skill level, which tells you how well that they will do their job. Uh, they could be fair, good, superior, excellent, or masterful. Same thing with gem cutters. Important, players should never know the skill levels of jeweler gem cutters. So you just don't know how good they are. That's kind of funny actually, because it's such a specific um, narrow field of expertise. You're never quite sure how well they're doing, right? Stuff always kind of looks about the same. Dwarven jeweler gem cutters add 20% to skill level determination rolls. They cost twice as much to employ as far as gold piece outlay is concerned. Gnome jeweler gem cutters add nothing to jeweler skill, but add 30% to gem cutter skill. They likewise cost double with regard to monthly wage. Mercenary soldier. The likelihood of encountering any given type of mercenary is strictly up to you as DM. A table below shows suggested probabilities as well as typical numbers. Types will seldom be mixed. It's, um, turn the page here. There we go. If more than five are encountered, one will be a sergeant or a leader type or equivalent of a non-commissioned officer. It is urged that one sergeant for every 10 troops be used as a minimum figure with regard to regular soldiers and leader types. Captains will have to be hired for each sort of troop type. Note that regular soldiers are zero level men at arms with four to seven hit points each. So by rolling on this table, you can figure out um, the troop type and how many of them that you encounter. So it could be archers, artillerists, uh, captain, crossbowmen, footmen of different types, uh, lieutenants, um, hobelars. I don't actually know what that is. Uh, horsemen, uh, sappers, miners, slingers, and so on. So in theory, you could like run into horsemen and then roll on this table over here and then end up with 30 of them. So you could run into like 30 horsemen and decide to try and hire them. So first off, we have, um, there we go. Uh, archers, uh, longbowmen. These troops will be able to operate as light infantry when not support when not employing bows. They can use any typical weapons, for they must be strong and in good health. Archer, short bows. These troops will not fight in infantry when not using their bows, unless it is a desperate situation. In extremis, they will fight on using, uh, they will fight as light infantry using short bows, hand axes, and similar weapons. You may desire to allow certain types, such as the historical Viking warriors, to be exceptional. If so, these individuals will certainly demand longbowmen's wages. Artillerists. These troops are required to operate any missile engines larger than a heavy crossbow. They will fight as light infantry only in extremis. Captain. A captain is nothing more than a capable uh, capable leader, a fighter of 5th, 6th, 7th, or 8th levels. According to the D10 score, um, T minus 4? Or 1 through 4. 1 through 4 equals 5th level, 5, uh, five through 7 equals 6th level, 8th through 9th equals 7th level, 0 is an 8th level. But not capable of working upwards. A captain can command as many scores of troops as he or she has levels. For example, a fourth level enables command of 80 men, fifth level enables command of 100 men, etc. Hmm. In addition, the level of the captain uh, dictates the number of lieutenants which can be controlled. This is exclusive uh, of surgeons and any auxiliary types such as servants, cooks, etc. The monthly cost of a captain is 100 gold pieces per level. So I can really see how you would be draining your players' resources. If you get to a high enough level where you are you know, getting the hundreds of thousands of XP necessary to level up, and you have a, a fortress that you've built, and you're hiring you know, these guys, captains and troops, you're going to be losing money like crazy, which makes sense. So it's a good way to keep the players hungry. 
Crossbowmen. These soldiers are able to use any sort of crossbow uh, furnished. Each heavy crossbowman will typically desire a light infantryman to accompany him to act as a shield bearer. Crossbowmen will bear handheld weapons and fight as light foot if meleeed by enemy troops. Footmen heavy. These troops are trained to fight in close formation. They do so regardless of the type of armor that they are equipped with. Weaponry can be sword and shield, axe and shield, pole arms, etc. Footmen light. These soldiers do not fight for in close formation. They are useful in rough terrain, woods, etc. Footmen pikemen. These soldiers are heavy foot who are especially trained to fight with pikes and also maneuver with them. Mercenary pikemen will be high quality, not militia or levy quality. Heavy footmen can be placed in the center of a pike formation of 100 or more troops. If these troops have been trained for not less than two months with the pikemen. Hobilar, heavy or light. These troops are simply mounted infantry, able to use horses to move, but not capable of mounted combat. Thus, hobelars uh, ride to battle, but dismount to fight. Some provision must be made to care for the horses, or the hobelars will leave 25% of their number behind to do so. Horsemen, archer. These light troops are generally pneumatic types, undisciplined and prone to looting. They will fight hand-to-hand -hand only if circumstances force this action upon them. They can wear leather, ring, or chainmail, and can carry small shields for use when not plying their bows. Horsemen, crossbowmen. All such troops are armed with light crossbows, as heavy weapons are not suitable on horseback. Not usable on horseback. They are light troops, but they can wear any sort of armor. They will wield handheld weapons in combat if necessary. Horsemen, heavy. These soldiers are trained to operate in close formation, stirrup to stirrup. They were able to use most uh, weapons common to horsemen. Horsemen light. These troops are not trained to operate in close quarters, in, cl in close orders or formation. They are useful skirmish raider types only. Horsemen medium. Similar to heavy cavalry, medium horsemen are trained to operate in formation, but they are generally smaller um, individuals on lighter horses and do not ride as close to their fellows. Lieutenant. A lieutenant is an uh, assistant to a captain or a leader in his own right. Fighter level is second, D10 score one through seven, or third, D10 score eight through zero. And, has lieut and the lieutenant can command as many decades of troops as he or she has levels. Why doesn't he just say he can command 10 people per level? Like, yeah, he always wants to take the most roundabout and obscure way of saying things. As many decades of troops, so as many tens of troops as he or she has levels. This is exclusive of, of sergeants, of course. A lieutenant serving under a captain extends the number of troops the captain can effectively command and control. The level of a lieutenant determines how many sergeants he or she is able to direct, and these addition, these in addition to those normally serving with the troops. For example, two or three additional sergeants um, who can do special duty. The monthly cost of a lieutenant is 100 gold pieces per level. They cannot progress in level. Sapper slash miner. These troops are required for any military operations which, can use, which involve the use of siege machinery, towers, trenches, mines, etc. Although they will only fight to preserve their lives, they do fight as heavy footmen. They normally wear only light armor because of their duties, leather or studded leather, if they are active. Sergeant. The sergeant in a, is a leader of a small body of troops, a non-commissioned officer equivalent. All sergeants are first level fighters, but incapable of progressing further. A sergeant can command up to 10 soldiers as an independent unit or, or a sure orders from lieutenants or a captain are carried out. There must be one sergeant minimum for every 10 regular soldiers, and there can be one per five. The monthly cost for a sergeant is 10 times the rate of the troops he or she commands. So a sergeant of heavy horsemen costs 60 gold pieces, one of the light footmen only 10. Slingers. Slingers are trained from youth, up as are longbowmen, and are thus rarely encountered. They can wear leather, including studded uh, leather, padding, or ring mail only, but they are also able to employ no small shields um, at the same time as they ply their slings. They are always light infantry, and are able to, and are, and they are able to use only lesser handheld weapons, such as axes, uh, hand axes, clubs, short swords, and daggers. I feel like a lot of this information could really have just been put into a table, you know, just like a big table. We have your different types, you know, what they cost per month um, and things like that. I don't know. 
I think a lot of stuff in this book could have been put into a table just to like make the information more dense. Non-human soldiers. There can be various units of non-human troops available for mercenary duty, but this depends upon your milieu. Ding, ding, ding. Another milieu. Uh, it is suggested that as a general rule, such troops be enlisted only where they actually dwell and only if the player character champions their cause or is a minion of their alignment, religion, or the like, or is a racial hero. The types of soldiers available uh, depends entirely on the race. See Monster Manual for such information. The less in intelligent non-humans will serve for from 10% to 60% less cost. But these evil creatures will certainly expect to loot, pillage, and rape freely at every chance, and kill and probably eat captives. Dwarves will serve at double rates or at normal rates if they are basically aiding uh, a champion of their cause and people. Gnomes and halflings will only serve in the latter case. Elves are a difficult case to handle, for they might serve against hated foes or for a cause, but in either event probably for greater cost or special considerations only. Half-humans such as half-elves and half-orcs might be found amongst uh, either human contingents or with, the, or with those of their non-human parent race. Possible non-human soldiers are bugbears, dwarves, elves, gnolls, gnomes, goblins, halflings, hobgoblins, kobolds, lizardmen, and orcs. Sages are a very special case indeed, for they are the encyclopedias, computers, expert opinions, and sorts of demi-oracles of the milieu, ding, 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 all rolled into one. Even in a quasi-medieval fantasy world, the sum of human knowledge will be so great and so diverse as to make it totally impossible for any one sage to know more than a smattering about many things, a fair understanding of their overall field, and a thorough knowledge of their particular specialty or specialties. The general fields of study for sages are shown hereafter, with special areas of expertise listed under each general category. Sage ability. While any sage is capable of carrying on a discussion in any field of knowledge, what he or she actually has expertise in is an entirely different matter. Thus, any given sage will know that the general field of his or her chosen study well, with expertise in two or more special areas. In addition, he or she will be able to give reasonable advice in one or two other fields, but have absolutely no experience in any of the special categories of the other fields. Note that expertise in a limited number of special categories does not imply that the sage is limited in talent, only that he or she has devoted major effort into, special, into limited areas, and his or her knowledge of those special categories will be exceptionally good. When taking the persona of a sage, it is therefore very important for the DM to assume not only that the role, but also the overview and personal dedication of the character. The number of fields of study, major and minor, and the specialization categories are determined by use of the two tables given hereafter. Find the number of fields of study first. So they could have up to two minor fields and up to four special categories in a major field, depending on how well you roll. To use the above information on the following table, roll first for, or choose, one field of study to be the sage's major field, then choose the proper number of special categories within that field. Finally, roll or choose the indicated number of minor fields. So here we go, a big list of possible fields of knowledge. We have humankind, which is art and music, biology, uh, demography, history, languages, legends and folklore, law and customs, philosophy and ethics, politics and genealogy, psychology, sociology, theology, and myth. Um, or you could have demi-humankind, uh, similar things, basically the same categories. You could have humanoids and giant kind. Uh, fields of study are biology, demography, history, languages, legends and folklore, law and customs, sociology, and theology and myth. You could have the physical universe. So that could be architecture and engineering, astronomy, chemistry, geography, geology and mineralogy, mathematics, meteorology and climatology, oceanography, physics, topograph topography, and cartography. You could have flora, which would be bushes and shrubs, flowers, fungi, grasses and grains, uh, herbs, uh, mosses and ferns, trees and weeds. You could have fauna, 
amphibians, arachnids, avians, cephalopods, and echidnoderms, uh, crustaceans and mollusks, um, ichthyoids, uh, insects, mammals, marsupials, reptiles. You could also have supernatural and unusual. So astrology, numerology, uh, cryptography, divination, uh, dweomer, dweomer craft. I've never known how to spell that or how to pronounce that word. Heraldry, signs, and sigils, medicine, uh, metaphysics, planes, astral, elemental, and ethereal, um, or the outer planes. Chance of knowing an answer to a question. So if it's out of their field, then they might have a general understanding of it, but it's not going to have an exact understanding. Uh, in the minor field, you have better odds. Uh, major field, even better odds, or in a special category, you have very good odds. It's a neat system, actually. I really like it. It adds a lot of specificity to your sages. And um, so you actually know what you can get out of them. It also gives you a very um, precise resource to use when you're stuck in a situation. If you're in a big campaign and you just need to know something, you can actually track down a sage and consult them. A lot of games don't really get into how players will dig up information. Um, Oftentimes it'll just be go to a library, but really sages are libraries. Um, depending on the milieu, of course, uh, you might have a game where there are big libraries, but having individual people to go to is a lot more interesting um, because it's less abstract and you can actually play the person that they're talking to. I think that's really cool. Um, I think I'm going to pause right there. We've been going for almost exactly two hours. And as usual, my voice runs out after about two hours. But this has been really fun. There's been a lot of interesting things in here. In fact, some of the most interesting bits, I think, were the section on um, alignment and some of these tables. Like, I really like this table about sages. That's something that I would definitely steal from my own games. I haven't seen any other books really do that. And stuff like um, the list of special abilities for different types of gems. That sort of uh, library content, I guess you would call it is useful for any type of game. It's very system neutral. And that's the stuff that I really like. All the specifics about how many troops a lieutenant can command and so on is just eh, probably not going to use that. But this stuff is really, really great. How far do we get? We're on page 32. How far do we have to go? I'm not including all this stuff at the back in the index. Should I read the, the glossary? Maybe. It's like 230 pages. So about 200 pages left to go. Moving at a fast clip. <laughs> this book isn't actually that many pages, but the, the type font is tiny. So they just packed a ton of information in here. All right. So that's it for today. Thanks for hanging out, guys. Uh, I'll definitely continue this at some point in the future. Uh, remember to subscribe to the channel and click the bell icon so you actually get notified when that happens. Uh, or follow me on Twitter. I do try and put out notifications on there as well. Um, so that's it for today. Thanks for watching, everybody. And I'll see you guys next time.